Now hit. And so let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll begin our study, shall we? Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to assemble together once again on a Tuesday night to know you more through your word. We know that there's nothing more important than to get grounded in your word, namely Bible doctrine, because this is how we live. This is how we ought to, to, to think, having the mind of Christ. And so the more that we saturate our minds with the word of God, then we know what to say, we know what to do, how to make decisions, and ultimately it allows us to not only be safe from making wrong decisions or poor decisions, but ultimately it brings honor and glory to you. So Father, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment of silence and just give everyone an opportunity to use 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I will pause for a moment. I'll just take a step out of here and get my little book, Basic Training Field Manual. And in the meantime, use 1 John 1, 9. Use this as a, an opportunity for spiritual preparation. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. It gives you the opportunity to make your peace with God. What I mean by that is, although you're a son or a daughter of the Most High, you still, from time to time, as I do as well, we sometimes blunder, we sometimes sin, we have, we have negative thoughts, we say things that are not uh, honoring to God. And so when we realize that, we have an opportunity to start right, and namely to confess our sins to God. And he is open arms, just willing to, to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And the advantage there is that he fills us with God, the Holy Spirit. Are we indwelt? Yes, we are. Are we filled? Are we empowered? As we, are we enabled? Depends. You have sin in your life. And if you do, that's the purpose of 1 John 1, 9. You will never be sinless, but you can sin less over time as you mature. So just take a moment of silence and use 1 John 1, 9. And in about two minutes, I'll be back. <clears throat> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity once again to resume our studies. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We're on page 89 on the book, Basic Training Field Manual. And so what I'm going to do is just read the top of page 89. And then we're going to look at the verse. I'm going to put my notes here on the screen so that we can look at it together. Okay. So I'm going to read the top, and then I'm going to put the notes on the screen. Top of 89 says the following. Take up your cross and follow him. Page 89. So now let's look. Well, before we do, verse under observation. Um, James chapter 2, 14 to 17. Now, this will tie in with picking up your cross and following him. So sometimes these reformed theologians or pastors will merge or use pretty much the same verses to support what they believe in. And so there's nothing wrong with kind of congregating together and having similar views, like I subscribe to the free grace position or the doctrinal position, and there's nothing wrong with me with drubbing shoulders who are like-minded, nothing wrong with that unless if we're wrong. So this is why we study closely the text and context to see what the verse is saying. And I'll many times gravitate and go into the original languages so that I can extrapolate the nuance of meaning that's found only in the Greek text or Hebrew if it's the Old Testament or Aramaic. That way it'll allow us to have a much more crisper, 
an accurate rendering of the word itself. So let's look at the verse in front of us, the passage in front of us, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. You've all have heard this before, so let's pick it apart, okay? Here we go. The verse under observation is James 2, 14 to 17, which reads as follows. What does it profit, my brethren, if, an, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Uh-oh. Can faith save him? Uh-oh, again. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, ah, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Uh-oh, looks like they have a case here, right? Well, let's see. Now I'm going to give you the NLT translation because that's a very simple translation of the Bible. Um, it helps to give us a different angle in simple terms. So I'm going to use the NLT now. So we read what the New King James Version. Now let's look at the NLT. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters? So we know that he's talking to what? Believers, right? Brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Oh, so now there's this <clears throat> qualifier that if your, faith, if your faith doesn't have actions, can that faith that you have save anyone? And then James goes on to say, well, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. And you say, goodbye and have a good day. I'll pray for you. Stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food. What good does that do? You see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. You see that? It's dead and useless. So that sounds like it's, it's a... It's got some merit now. Now it's saying, hey, if you don't have any actions be behind what you're saying, then it might be head faith, but not heart faith. How many times have you heard that before? It's in your head, but it's not in your heart. Well, may I say that there is no such thing in the Bible as a head faith and a heart faith. It's either faith or no faith, belief or unbelief. There is no adjective. There's no head faith heart faith. It's either faith or no faith, belief or unbelief. So now let's get down to the nitty gritty. I'll go back to the New King James Version because this is what we typically hear in any preaching, in any church where you're listening about James 2. If you're hearing the pastor teach or preach on James chapter 2, what does it benefit or what does it profit? My who? My brethren. So we know by context when we see the word brethren, it always points to those in the household of faith. It's not talking about your brother, your sister, your biological brother or sister. He's building his case. He says, look, my brethren, you all who say you have faith. If someone says he has faith, so someone there in your Bible study, your Bible class, your church, they say they have faith, but they don't have what? Works. Works means works. That word there in the original text is ergon. Ergon just simply means works. So there's no way to escape that. Works means works. When you get to Revelation 20, they, the people there standing before the great white throne judgment will be judged based on their ergon, their works. Not to show off and prove whether or not they have enough works, but to show, God is going to show them that even though they had lots and lots of good deeds, good works, they still fall short because they don't have the imputed righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, there's something called plus R. Within the doctrinal churches, the free grace churches, there's something called plus R. There's minus R and plus R. Plus R means you have righteousness. 
Minus R means you have no righteousness. Now, when you hear plus R, that means you understand that you have righteousness that is acceptable to God. That's the kind of righteousness that has been imputed or credited to your account the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ. That's important to know because when you talk to people and they, they talk about good works, bad works, uh, half-hearted works, and so all these other kinds of works, it's important to know that the only way we make it to heaven it's not on the, on the basis of how many good deeds we have done. Um, <clears throat> it's based on whether or not you have plus R. That plus R can only be received when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. So now th let that sink in for a moment. Plus R, plus righteousness. In fact, the scripture says in the Old Testament that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So there is no amount of righteous acts that we can commit that God will say, good job. I'm proud of you. You did more good deeds than the other person down the street. It's not about how many good deeds or how many righteous acts you have done. In fact, in the eyes of God, it's considered like filthy rags and that it's a little bit more descriptive. It's, it's, don't let this bother you. Don't let this shock you because it comes from scripture but the filthy rags in the Old Testament, when it says your righteous acts are like filthy rags, I want you to think, because this is what it refers to, when a, when a woman is on her menstrual period, that's the filthy rags that the scripture is talking about. So you can see in the eyes of God that your righteous acts or your good deeds are like filthy menstrual rags to God. Get it? Now, that's coming from the word of God. I'm not fabricating that. That's what it actually means. So now I want you to think about that. When a person you're talking to, sharing the gospel to, they say, well, I'm not a bad person. I, have, I do good things. I pay my taxes. I feed pigeons. I don't kill anybody. You know, I'm, I'm, pretty good, I'm a pretty good person. Just remember what God's word says about that pretty good person. As long as they have minus R, they're going to go to the lake of fire. Is that being judgmental? No, that's the reality of what God's word says, which is why we study it intelligently, contextually, historically, grammatically, isagogically, so that we understand what it means, what it said back then, and what it means today, so that you'll be well-equipped to interact with those who say they don't need God who say that they're a pretty good person. I always have to remember that person, unless they believe in Christ, is what? Minus R. No righteousness. Because the righteousness that impresses God, there's only one righteousness that impresses God himself. That's his own. So they need plus R. So you learn the letter R tonight, right? M plus R minus R. It's either going to have a plus in front of it or a minus. If they have a minus, they're headed for the lake of fire. Unless you make a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. For God so loved the world, he loved you, my friend, that he gave his only begotten son. If you would believe, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. And that everlasting life is credited to your account. Why? Because now that you've been justified, you've been declared righteous, not because of your good deeds, because, but because you now have plus R, <clears throat> which originated from Jesus Christ, that has been credited to your account the moment you look to him via faith, you now are saved, born again, a new creation in Christ, plus R person. You're a plus R person. You're in the plus R club. Everybody else in the, is in the minus R club. So please remember that. That's important. If you've never heard that before, well, that's good. You're hearing it tonight. That's part of why we do Bible class, because it has to be meaningful. It has to be something that will, will catch in your soul so that you can see, huh, the word of God is interesting. It isn't so hard after all, as long as I'm learning from someone who knows what they're talking about. 
hopefully I know what I'm talking about. I spent enough time doing this, went to tra- school for this. So I hopefully I know enough to be able to be representing God. I'm not here patting myself on the back saying, I know everything. Not at all. What I'm saying is I shift, I knock on my knees, trusting that I'm bringing honor and glory to him because I'm going to be judged much more stricter according to James. So I'm held more accountable because I'm teaching and I'm, ex- I'm dispensing biblical truth as found in the word of God. And if I'm off, I have to answer to God. I may be steering thousands of people or more away, and I have to answer to God for that. So I'm not, I don't want to be um, falling short here because, because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. I could be taken home early. I could be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They lied. Boom. The Ananias fell on the ground. Men took them out, took them out of the room. And then they, they said, why did you lie with your husband? Well, uh, did you really sell it for so-and-so? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, you lied just like your husband. You see the feet out there outside of the house? They're here to pick you up too. He's going to bear it. They're going to bury you next to your husband. So I don't want discipline from God and you wouldn't want it either. This is why I'm always challenging you. I, I may sometimes sound like I'm abrupt trying to get in your face to do something for God. I am getting in your face to do something for God because time is of the essence and you're accountable to God for what you do and what you don't do. So let's go back to this now. Okay. James 2, 14 to 17. Please look closely. What does it benefit? That's another way of saying profit. What does it benefit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? So let's step back and look at what it's saying again. What's the benefit? What's the profit? If someone among you says he has faith but does not have works to back it up, can faith save him? Verse 15. He now expands on that a little bit so that we understand what he's saying. See, we don't want to just read it and then say, oh, see, you're you're not saved. You're going to hell. No, no, no. Always bang the, the text with questions. Who, what, where, when, why? Bombard the text with questions. Who, what, where, when, why? Who's in view? What's he talking about? Where is this taking place? Why is this taking place? Well, James doesn't want people to just gab away and say, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer. I believe. I'm a part of the family of God. Look, he calls me brethren. So therefore, I'm saved. Now watch this. So he says, okay, <clears throat> what's the benefit, brethren, if you have faith, but you don't have what? You don't have works. Can faith save them? See? So now we have to make sense out of that. Can faith save him? Well, I thought I'm saved. Well, you are. But again, here's the value of looking closely and intelligently, contextually, from someone with the assistance of someone who has studied this over and over and over, because this is a big divide among Reformed theologians, Reformed pastors, and free grace and doctrinal pastors. This is a big, 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 big bigaboo. Bugaboo. So what does it benefit? If someone says he has faith, but does not have works. If you don't mind, I'd like to rephrase it like this so that you get the picture here. Because the interpretation will make better sense if I reword certain things. Not because I'm changing or modifying God's word, but because that's what it means in its context. It could mean one of two things. And this is why I'm teaching you how to look at this, okay? So first of all, what good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? So big picture is he's talking to the believers. That's us. If someone says he has faith but does not have works. So can I change a word here? And I'll explain why I'm changing it. Not because I want to modify or tweak God's word. I can't improve upon it. But in the context of the 21st century, it might make better sense because it was written 2,000 years ago, right? So we have to somehow 
bring that up to speed because we were not there 2000 years ago. There's nothing wrong. Why do you think I use the NLT? The NLT is the committee of the NLT as well as other translation. Their objective and goal is to take the Greek language, the Hebrew language, the Aramaic and portions of the word of God and use terminology and verbiage that the 21st century people today can understand. So they're always modifying. Have you ever said to yourself, how come there's so many translations of the Bible? Why isn't there just one correct Bible? Why do we need all these translations, right? Well, the reason why is because <clears throat> every translation has a philosophy. Every translation has an objective. Some are aiming to get to the fifth graders, sixth graders, the younger generation, the younger people. Some are trying to hit those in the high school level. Some are in the academia, those who are in, uh, studying the word of God with Greek and Hebrew, which is why I use the New King James Version, because that's what I was using in seminary. So the, the, the translations at the time that were most closest to the Greek and Hebrew, as far as the English translation is concerned, is the New King James and the New American Standard. You can't go wrong with either of those translations because they're truer to the text of the Greek and Hebrew. That doesn't mean you can't use in any other translation. It just means for in-depth Bible study purposes, if you want something a little bit more closer, then those translations are the ones that I grew up with, New American Standard and New King James Translation. Uh, so let's go back to this. I'm going to modify it now based on my studies and what I have learned to, to adopt into this passage. Let's read it like this. I'm going to read it like this. Listen to it, okay? What does it profit? What's the benefit, everyone, believers? If someone says he has doctrine, but does not have works. That make better sense now? I can use the word doctrine. I could use the word Bible. Let me switch the word from faith to doctrine, faith, to Bible. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has doctrine but does not have works? What does it benefit, brethren, if someone says he has God's word but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So you have doctrine. I inserted the word doctrine. I inserted the word Bible in there to give you the sense of where James is going with this. So now he shifts. Notice. It goes from someone says he has faith, but he doesn't have works. Then in verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. I'm in the middle of Bible class. I'm in the middle of a prayer meeting. Don't bother me. But do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What is the benefit? What does it profit? So now when you get to 17, so doctrine, the Bible by itself, if it does not have works, is what? Dead or useless. You have a car. Uh, Ruben, uh, he fixes a lot of cars in his uh, shop up, up north. Uh, Ruben, is it Sacramento or Stockton? Or is it? I don't know. No. Uh, what's that, Ruben? Sacramento. Sacramento. Oh, Sacramento. Okay. Sacramento, Pastor. Okay, Sacramento. So Ruben fixes a lot of cars there. So that's important because I lost my train of thought now that I'm thinking Stockton. But um, so, see, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Oh, yeah. Here's my point. Uh, he works with, with a lot of cars. And sometimes the battery in the car might be dead. They might ask him to replace the battery. The lights might be um, not working. So not only does he buff it out and clean it with his chemicals, but he'll sometimes replace the lights probably, right, Ruben? And so he fixes it because what good is it to have a nice car fixed up, uh, buffed out lights, but the light itself doesn't work? So... Just because the light doesn't work doesn't mean the car doesn't exist. Just because the battery is dead doesn't mean it's not a car anymore. So likewise, faith 
if it's by itself, see verse 17, faith or doctrine or Bible apart, if it's by itself without application, if it does not have accompanying works, it's dead, it's useless. So if a car has a battery in it, but it's dead, is it still a car? Yes, it is. It's still a car. But if the battery is dead, let, let's just say you have a Lamborghini or a Bentley and it's in your front front yard. What good is it to have this um, fine looking car worth a lot of money, but the battery is dead? The car is useless until you get that battery to work. Now it's profitable. So that's what this is saying in James 2. What does it benefit if someone ha- says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? Someone has faith, does, he, he has doctrine, but he doesn't have works. And then he gives the example of a brother or sister is naked. So the connection there is when you string it together. So among your group, you have all this doctrine, you have all this theology, you're growing, no doubt, you're learning all this stuff. But what good is it someone is in need naked, destitute of daily food. And then you said, depart in peace, be warm and filled, do, but you do not give them the things which are needed for what? The body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it does not have works, doctrine by itself, it does not have works. The Bible all by itself, you have the Bible in the back seat. the sun is beaming and it's fraying the leather, It's good for nothing because now it's just sitting in the back. If you're not going to use it, the things that you've learned, and it's just sitting in the back, what good is it? Here's a homeless guy over there. Here's a guy who needs help. This guy lost his job, and you're saying, oh, let me pray for you. That's dead works. What good is it to have faith, but you have no accompanying works? What should you have done if your brother or sister lost his job? So do you say... Oh, well, be warm and filled. I'll, I'll, be, pr- I'll be thinking about you. I- I'm going to pray that you um, get a new job. No, that's not the best way to help the person. If you have all this Bible doctrine stored up in your soul, and you know better that you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, love one another as I have loved you, and yet you shun that, James calls that dead. It's useless. Faith without any kind of works with your doctrine, without with your Bible studies, all the things you've accumulated and amassed the past two years. If all you can do is just say, well, take care, man. I'll be praying for you. That your faith then is dead. It's still faith, though. Notice faith without this. Let's make this works. Faith, which is faith minus works is dead, verse 17. So in total, James is saying, look, you've got all this Bible class, Bible studies stored up in your soul, but you're not even putting it to use. The purpose, ladies and gentlemen, for studying the Bible, getting into doctrine, is not to razzle all your friends who belong to different churches and say, I bet you didn't know this, I learned this the other night, and guess what it really means? It's not what your pastor is saying. It's not to impress people with this knowledge. The purpose of knowing what it actually means is so that you can use it. Because as James says here, what good is it to have all this faith and doctrine minus works? See, that's that's where the focus should be. What is James talking about? Faith, which is faith. The person has faith, they're a believer, but without works is dead. Another word for dead is useless. There you are, you're in a position to help someone, but you don't help. Shame on you, shame on me. God has allowed us to learn his word so that we can make a difference in people's lives. And the only thing you can do is just keep it to yourself. Do nothing about it. Do not do nothing with the knowledge that you've learned and acquired over the last two years. God, God would be grieved. You're grieving God, the Holy Spirit, when you have all this knowledge from his word, all this doctrine. But when someone is in need, 
You don't do anything. You're a poor representative of God because doctrine is God in action. Doctrine is what God himself would do. You know, the word of God is a, a reflection of Jesus Christ. That's why you've often heard me say, and I'm sure you've heard it other places, Jesus Christ is the living word. And the Bible, this here in my hand, is the written word. The written word always matches the living word. So as you and I study the written word, guess who we're getting to know more? The living word. The written word comes from the living word, namely Jesus Christ. And the living word has given us his Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, so that we can take what we're learning about Jesus in the written word and apply it. Why? So that we can represent him here on earth. We're not going to be tested here. You're not going to go to school tomorrow or college and say, okay, I'm ready for the test. That's not how we're being tested. How we're being tested, ladies and gentlemen, is that when we stand before the, uh, before the throne of grace in the Bema Seat Judgment, he's going to tally up what we have done for him. And contrary to popular belief, all believers, all will be judged. Not to go to heaven or hell, but based on your works done on his behalf. You, he will know what you have done, and he will ask us, why did you not do this? I was nudging you. I was trying to get your attention. You flat out ignored me. You have to answer to that. I can't help you there. And likewise, whatever he tells me to do something, and if I just say, well, today I'm not really, I'm tired. I, I don't want to. I have to answer to that. The Bema Seat Judgment is based on rewards for the believer, but he will scour through our lives and remind us what we did, where we fell short. The good and the not so good are going to be revealed through fire, according to scripture. So just know that you're going to be judged, as am I. So don't think that, oh, I'm, once I'm saved, I'm, I'm good, as long as I get to heaven. No, you will have to stand before people. And I don't even know how many people are going to be around. I don't know if we're going to see when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, oh, uh, you know, Winston, you know, uh, God, Jesus Christ is going to judge Winston. And he's going to say, Winston, you did good here, not so good here. Tess, you did great here, not so great here. Susan, you did good here. But remember those days when I was trying to get your attention, you kind of turned the other way, not so good here. My point is, Unlike the great white throne judgment where everyone is going to be judged simultaneously, I believe, I think all believers are going to be judged at the judgments or the Bema Seat judgment as well. Now, who's going to be there? I don't know. And I, I would be embarrassed to know that you guys are going to be watching me. You're going to be like, wow, well, I'm proud. I'm sure he probably got a lot of rewards. And then only to find out I get a cup full. <laughs> Maybe I fall short and, he, and he's counting it by uh, one, two. There's one more here somewhere and I get three rewards. I might, I'm going to be so embarrassed and say, oh my gosh, Tess is laughing at me. Winston and Anita is laughing at me. What did you do, Pastor Freddie? You've been teaching us all this time. You only had four rewards? Oh, I, I thought I had five, to be honest. So I don't know who's going to be there. I can't prove it one way or the other. I have a sense that in the great white throne judgment, people are going, myriads of people are going to be there watching as the unbelievers are getting judged. We won't be there because we won't have access to that. We have been, we are separated from the unbelievers. The just will not be with the unjust where we have our own judgment. So I don't know who's going to watch what I get. And I don't know if I'm going to watch what you get. I don't know how that's going to look like, but I get the sense that um, somehow we'll know. Why do I say that? Because it does talk about wood, hay, and stubble. So if that's the case and it's visible to the naked eye, then that leads me to believe that we might be able to see who gets what. 
oh, Freddie got more wood than precious stones. So what will that tell you? Think about that. If I'm standing before, if we're all standing before the beam of seat judgment, which is supposed to be rewards, not fire, not lake of fire or hell, and I'm getting judged for my works, I'm there and Jesus Christ is doling out my rewards. Okay, one for you, another one for you, Freddie, you've got a total of seven. Uh, congratulations, you've earned seven based on your life of serving me. And you might be, as I'm walking away, I might be hiding it like this. I have a uh, wood. I have more wood to burn, or I guess. I have wood and I'm trying to hide it because I'm a little embarrassed. I'm supposed to have more than just pieces of wood. I should have hopefully uh, gold, silver. And what's the other one? Precious stones. So if I'm kind of with my head down and I, I'm trying to pretend, hey, what's that over there? Is that a bird? Trying to distract you. I might be a little embarrassed thinking, I can't believe I've only, on my all my years of service, I get uh, two twigs. Probably not twigs, but it does talk about wood, hay, and stubble, 1 Corinthians 3. I'm saying all this to kind of jumpstart your service to God, because with all that's going on, election around the corner, um, all these uh, upheavals, I'm telling you, these are the signs of the times. We're living in an exciting time because this is what's called the dispensation of the church age, where we are living in a time never before seen in the Old Testament, never before seen in the New Testament even, only to be seen now, here and now. Because if you look at the dispensations, you see that there's the dispensation of innocence, you have the story of Adam and Eve, you have the story of Abraham, Moses, uh, Noah, you, you have the separation and breaks of time where God interacts with certain players in that time frame. The time frame we are now living in together is called the church age, sometimes known as the age of grace. Some call it the age of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you are more comfortable with, just know that they all mean one and the same. The, age, the dispensation of um, the church age, dispensation of grace, dispensation of the Holy Spirit. In other words, bottom line is we're living in a time where the Holy Spirit lives in us. We're living in a time where grace has been displayed to us through the person of Christ 2,000 years ago on the cross. And now we're the bearers of that truth. We're taking the living word who lives in us and we're studying his written word um, so that we can live just like Christ amidst these times, the tumultuous times where people are getting shot. There was just someone here in Virginia. Well, I was just tell, telling Joshua in Fairfax County, uh, someone was gunned down in a gym, a gym. There was no, they don't, they're still trying to figure out why, but guess what? It's happening in California too. So don't point the fingers here point the fingers everywhere. And that just lets me know that we're in seeing this intensification, the angelic conflict, this invisible war, where the angels, the, the fallen angels, a third of the fallen angels, a third of the angels are here near you, near me, all around us right now. And they've ramped up their time trying to make it so confusing so that we won't be able to know what to do next. And that's exactly what they want us to do. They want us to be so sidetracked and distracted with guns and uh, people killing everyone that we don't have time for this, the Bible. Well, you probably noticed something about me. I prioritize the word of God above all things in my life. Nothing comes before my relationship with God at all. And I prioritize that because I'm answerable to him later on. I don't want to hear him say, why did you not put me first? After all that I've done for you, after what I've seen you through, you still chose not to prioritize me. I have no answer to that. So I'm trying now to nudge you guys because as I'm looking around and studying verses like this, he wants us to be ready because uh, I think within this century, we're probably going to see much more evil like never before, and the rapture is going to 
pull us out of here. But in the meantime, he wants you and I. Yes, yes, Rudy. You know, sometimes I have a difficult time Mm -hmm. um, about the reward. But which one? Uh, The reward. Okay. Like uh, we always, I understand. Mm Mm-hmm. But explaining to people that you have a reward, yeah. Uh, para, to me, um, uh, to me, when I try to imagine the word reward, that means I have to do something That's to right. get a reward. Oh, but my point is, well, you mean to tell me if I don't do anything good? Mm-hmm. I don't get the reward. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by what? To me, uh, what uh, I think I try. This is my difficult uh, thing to mm-hmm. to translate to to people that I share with. Sometimes I avoid it, you know, <laughs> because yeah, you know, because to me the reward is the joy, yeah, uh, the eternal life that you're gonna have, yeah. the fellowship that you're gonna have. Uh, the the beautiful thing that God created, yeah, that will be will will be given to you, right? You know, that's well, what I, that's what I understand. But sometimes well, the word reward is very difficult for me for the people to understand it. Yeah, and they won't say anything. I well, said, ask me, a, you know, yeah. Well, it is difficult, but let's put it this way: when you look at First Corinthians three. He wants us, the purpose for rewards, Rudy, is to remain steadfast because, yes, we should be grateful for everlasting life, heaven versus hell. We should be grateful for those things. But the truth is, you have the lackadaisical, lackadaisical Christians that don't really care. They, they just, as long as I'm saved, I just want to be comfortable. As long as I go into heaven, that's all that matters. And yet... God has placed within the pages of scripture uh, reasons to be motivated to serve him. See, what we're going to see in just a moment, I've been gabbing away, but the problem what we're seeing is salvation is blurred with discipleship. That's where I'm going with this verse here and the verse that we're going to look at in the book. But see, discipleship is rewardable. Salvation is not. For some of us, salvation <clears throat> is already a reward. It's grace, right? Where, hey, as long as I make it to heaven, that's that's all I need. I don't need to be motivated to serve God because I'll do it anyways. But not everyone looks at it like that, unfortunately. So God makes and puts into the system for those that don't really care and they don't want to do anything. God is saying, look, this is what I'll give you if you'll serve me. And so... I used to grapple with that in the beginning because I I would say, well, you know, the fact that I have everlasting life, that's suffice. That's sufficient for me. I'm willing to do what I can because of what he has done for me. Once you see the gravity of what he has done for you, then you can't help but want to reciprocate. But see, God, knowing the human nature of man, he also places that as a as a motivating factor, so people will do something for him. I, I don't have. I, I, I think uh, what you, if you really, really understand mm-hmm. what the promise of God and how you are with the relationship with the God. Yeah. The one that you do is unconditional. Mm-hmm. Like He gave us an unconditional love. He did. So the the the, do, the work that we're gonna do is unconditional. To glorify him, we, we, that's the point, the yeah, word reward. I agree. To me, to me is the reward, the, the gift, the reward that he's going to give is the happiness in life. I even know. though we live, we, we, even though we're in this earth. Yeah. That we experience what we're going to experience more in well, heaven. Well, for, for example, um, some, you know, they they fear like if they have um, a life threatening uh, illness. Um, I've had one, and I wasn't afraid. I was. <laughs> the funny thing is, I was only afraid 
when I was recovering. But if you ask me now, am I afraid to die? No, I have complete peace that I know where I'm going, but some people don't, including Christians, because in the back of their mind, they're, they're still wondering, have, did I do enough? That's why we're looking at these things. I want us to make the distinction between salvation versus discipleship, because there's a um, teachings all over in the reform system of, of um, theology, where they link the two together. And so if you don't mind, because I've taken so much time, I'm just going to. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, we can always talk more about this uh, after yeah. our uh, study here. We'll save that for the end. So now here's the book, page 89. And I want us to, I'm just going to give you my two cents on the top verse, okay? We're not going to go through re reading all of this, but the verse that I want us to focus in, because this is our study, is take up your cross and follow him. Matthew 16, 24 says the following. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and what? Follow me. So there are a lot of pastors on radio, online ministry, on YouTube that use this verse to say, if you're really saved, if you want to be born again, then you must deny yourself and have a lifestyle of following him. As per Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, this is what it looks like. You should be daily denying yourself, picking up your cross, and then you can follow me. You must have all these components in place to be truly saved because Jesus is saying, pick up your cross. Now, if you're not doing this on a regular basis, I have every right to question whether or not you're truly a follower of Christ, AKA born again, because they will equate this to being born again. These are the signs. Faith without works is dead. What's the works? Well, you have to pick up your cross. So if you don't have, you may have faith, but if you don't have any works, what kind of works? Well, we already saw that the works there is works with faith. And when you have works with faith, doctrine with faith, it should look like this. If someone is in need, help them. Because what good is it if you have all this doctrine, but you don't apply it? So if someone is in need and you don't help them, don't you know that that's dead? So they will say that that passage is showing that you are never truly saved because faith without works is dead. And then they're going to link that with this verse. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, I don't know of any Christian that won't say that in your face. They will never say, well, I don't want to follow Jesus. But by, practically speaking, by their actions, they're shouting that at the top of their, up the top of the hills. But they'll say, if anyone wishes to come after me, make sure you deny yourself. Are you denying yourself, Rudy? Are you taking up your cross? Are you following Christ? If not, if these are not in place, you're not born again. So that's why I took James 2, Matthew 16, because they combine these. There's other verses that they combine to build a sermon. I could do the same thing. I said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, praise the Lord. Glad you're here. I see you back there. I see you raising your hand, coming down the aisle. You can do all that, but faith without works is dead. How do I know if you have faith without works? Because if you're not placing Jesus before anything else, if you're not denying yourself daily, if you're not taking up your cross and following Jesus, you have yet to be born again. Because we saw in James 2, faith without works is dead. So if you're not denying yourself, you're not picking up, up your cross and following him, you're not saved. You're not born again. So they'll link verses together to make you terrified, to scare the socks off you. And that's why I've been doing what I'm doing with you all, because I want you to see how to answer it. It's not talking about faith without works is proves you're not saved. You still have faith. You just don't have works. So you have a faith. It just doesn't have works. And what does that mean? You have doctrine, you have Bible studies all stored up inside you. You've amassed all this knowledge, but you're not using it. So that the example is when someone is in need and you don't help them, you just say, be free. We'll pray for you. That faith without works is dead. Bible without works is dead. Then they link it up to Matthew 16, 24. If you're not following him, picking up your cross, denying yourself, 
then you're not really born again, Rudy. You say you love Jesus, but you know what? I don't see you at the all the Bible studies recently. I don't see a church every Sunday. You're not denying yourself. You're at the beach. You're here going this with your wife. You're, you're, if you're denying yourself, that means you're not even going to take the time to go out to dinner with your wife or anybody else because you have to deny your comfort because Jesus said so. You have to put him first. Pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. So if you're hungry and you want to go out to the uh, dinner with your wife or your lunch with your wife and even your friends, no, because then you're taking care of yourself. You're not denying yourself. You're satisfying your, the gratitudes of the flesh. You're not denying yourself. You know what denying is? It's like if you're being denied a job, you're being denied food. That means you're not taking part in it. But if you deny, if you don't deny yourself and put him first, you are not saved on the basis of Matthew 16 and James 2 together, ladies and gentlemen. So hopefully you know how to answer James 2 now. Matthew 16, let me take you through my notes. We're going to dive into this, look closely and see what it's actually saying here. So now it says, <clears throat> take up your cross and follow. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus states, let anyone come after me. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take his cross, and follow me. This passage has been the subject of much theological discussion. From a free grace perspective, we interpret this verse in a way that maintains the distinction between salvation. Notice the choice of words here. We're making the distinction between salvation as a free gift and discipleship as a call to a committed Christian life. If you keep those two distinct, then you'll be able to understand how to answer those who believe otherwise. By the way, who are some of the men? Have you heard of John MacArthur? Have you heard of Paul Washer? Have you heard of R.C. Sproul? These are big hitting names. These are the reformed the theologians that teach this. That if you don't pick up the cross and follow Jesus and deny yourself, you're not saved, brother. That's why I want you to be comfortable with what the passage says in its context. So for number one, salvation versus discipleship. The free grace position firmly distinguishes between salvation and discipleship. Salvation is a free gift from God, received by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Whereas discipleship involves a voluntary commitment to follow Christ. So please notice the words I'm using here. I'm using it very carefully because it's different from a reform position. From a free grace position such as ours, discipleship involves a voluntary commitment to follow Christ. So please notice the words here, voluntary and commitment. They're not one and the same. Voluntary means you have to exercise your volition. You have to make a choice. Are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to put him first? That's voluntary. Commitment means you're willing to follow. You're willing to put him first. But that's voluntary. Why? Because he's, he's putting it out there. If anyone wants to follow me, let him do ABC. That's why I said it's voluntary. So please notice the choice of words I'm using. Voluntary means you exercise your volition. It's up to you. Some people don't want to. A lot of people don't want to. I know a lot of people don't want to. They just want to be saved. And so it's it involves a voluntary commitment to follow Christ and grow in spiritual maturity. That's discipleship. So moving on. The free grace perspective firmly distinguishes between salvation, which is faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, and discipleship. He who wants to follow me, come after me. Pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. That's discipleship. That's not salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God received by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. 
Discipleship, on the other hand, involves a voluntary commitment to follow Christ. You notice how I'm repeating things over and over and over? Because I really want it to be embedded. Because this, this may, may be the first, second time you listen to this tonight. You might be able to, oh, I, I get it now. Well, for the sake of the recording and those who are listening right now, because this is very important, Sometimes the best way to learn something is to hear it multiple times so that the next time you hear it, faith without works, is oh, that's not talking about salvation. That's talking about, you know, what good is it to have all this Bible, but you're not using it. I remember Pastor Freddie saying, Jesus Christ, the living word is recorded in the written word. And if you study the written word, then you can now emulate the living word. So it's the idea of following Jesus Christ. And that's called discipleship. So look at the bottom. Salvation is a one-time event resulting from faith in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's salvation. It doesn't require commitment, doesn't require ongoing following. That's discipleship. Salvation, one-time event resulting from faith in Christ. How long does it take to believe in Christ? Five seconds, maybe less. Twinkling of an eye, faith in him. Whereas discipleship is an ongoing, listen to this, ongoing process of spiritual growth and commitment. As you're being discipled, as you're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, now you're starting to have this spiritual momentum. You're now able to um, enjoy the growth and the commitment starts to escalate because you're feeling the peace that surpasses, you're experiencing the peace that surpasses all understanding, all understanding. That's the byproduct of an ongoing commitment to him. So if you if you listen to be anxious for nothing, now you apply the word of God, you disciple that verse. In other words, you apply it. You don't just say, well, I just want the peace that surpasses all understanding. No, he will not give that to you unless you obey him. What do you have to do to get the peace that surpasses all understanding? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God, and then the peace that surpasses all understanding, all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds through the person of Christ. You see how I did that? That's part of discipleship. That's not salvation. That's discipleship. So as you grow and you're committed now to him, you're committed to him because you're experiencing a real peace, as Rudy, Rudy's described multiple times tonight and even in the past. He enjoys life just by knowing that he's saved, knowing that uh, there's birds and lilies all around, and he's grateful to God just because he's saved now. All of that is a byproduct, not of discipleship, but because of salvation. He appreciates what God has given him. He appreciates answered prayers. He has experienced a lot of things that maybe we haven't. And that's why he can say, I have a hard time with reward. I just will do, I'll do whatever God wants me to do because that's the least I can do. I, he's worthy. And I totally agree with that. But salvation and discipleship are distinct and I say this because even though I don't think we have difficulty with understanding or comprehending that in this group, I know that you have heard these kind of teachings and it's online and Paul Washer and all these other DL, um, Martin, L., Martin Lloyd-Jones and others on radio are all these reformed theologians that teach a certain way. And so they may sound fanciful and all you know, um, well, I can't think of the word at the moment, but they may sound um, like they're holier than now, but sounding one way is doesn't necessarily mean that they are. I mean, it doesn't matter what a person sounds like. In fact, I just posted something on my wall today because um, I, I found it on another pastor who's also free grace he said, you know, don't be, don't look for a church that's closest to you. Find a church that's closest to the Bible and how true that is. So many people are so 
They want to be comfortable. They don't want to waste gas. They don't want to go here. It's too far. Gas is expensive today. Oh, shame on those person, those people. You're more concerned about saving money after God has saved you. <laughs> I, I, when I saw that, I said, oh, I got to post that because you can't get any truer to the true the doctrine than that. And people are more concerned about closeness to their home, making it comfortable rather than committed to God and his word. So hopefully more people are impacted by that. It doesn't originate with me. It originates with this other pastor, but he, he hit it right on the head. So salvation, I just remember this. It's a one-time event, the moment of faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. In other words, the moment you exercise your faith in Jesus, that's salvation. You are now born again. You don't have to keep putting your faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Why? Because once you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what is that called? You have been born again. So not only do you have physical birth, but you now have spiritual birth. You have this new life, new creation in Christ. So that is the salvation that transpires at the moment of faith. Some of you were born again 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I was born again in 1981. So that's when I was born again, and that was a one-time event, never to be repeated again. You don't have to be born again and again and again and again, but you can be committed. You can follow Christ. You can exercise discipleship, ongoing spiritual growth, and commitment. So now let me give you the context to Matthew 16. This is all studying, right? This is what we need. Understanding the context of Matthew 16 is critical or crucial. Jesus is addressing, guess who? His disciples. Guess what? If they're his disciples, they're already saved. They're already part of the team. Those who have already expressed faith in him. So it can't be to be saved, as some would teach. They're already saved. They're already believers. So he's not teaching them to um, pick up their cross and follow Jesus to be born again. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. His immediate context, 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 is his disciples who were already following him, who were already believers in Christ. So he's not teaching them how to be born again. He's teaching them how to prioritize Christ. If you want to follow me, if you want to if you, if you deny yourself, pick up the cross, that's all for those who are disciples or believers already here. They've already expressed faith in him. We're giving the context now. Therefore, this passage is a call to those who are already saved to enter, listen to this, into a deeper relationship of discipleship. Who's the audience? Believers who are called to deeper commitment. So if you, want, if you really want to follow Christ and uh, get into a deeper relationship with him, denying self, Picking up your cross is a part of that uh, protocol. So the audience are believers who are already called to deeper commitment. Purpose. Instructions on the cost and nature of discipleship. So that's the whole idea. How do we know that? Well, denying self. The point number three. Denying oneself in this context means setting aside personal ambitions, personal desires, and comforts to prioritize the will of Christ. And brothers and sisters of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, I do my darndest to lay aside my personal ambitions, my personal desires, and even my comforts to prioritize the will of Christ. That's why I do what I do every Tuesday night. I'd rather sleep sometimes and rest sometimes, but I don't. I know that you guys are committed to this and you know, if you're committed to it, I'm willing to teach it. I'm willing to bring honor and glory to our Lord. So denying oneself in this context of Matthew 16 means, listen, setting aside personal ambitions, desires, and comforts of your life and mine to prioritize the will of Christ. Now, what's this? This is part of what Jesus said in denying self. That's what this means. It's not talking about proving that you're really, really saved, as some of these reform pastors teach. They say, well, if you're not denying yourself, you're not really saved. Because Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, pick up the cross and follow me, Susan, you're really not saved. It's not saying that at all. 
This is discipleship. How do we know? Uh, that's why I painted the context. Who's in the context? His disciples, his disciples who are already believers in Jesus Christ. So it's not a test for proving salvation. It's an ongoing commitment to prioritize in Christ. And how does he describe it? Well, denying self. We saw that word, deny yourself and follow me. So denying oneself in this context, Matthew 16 context, means putting aside personal ambitions, desires, and comforts to prioritize the will of Christ. Are you doing that? If you're not doing, if you're not doing that, then you're not denying yourself. And if you're not denying yourself, well, you're not experiencing or living out a particular style of discipleship, which prioritizes God above your own interest and your own desires, your own comforts. Now, does that mean you're not saved? No. That's why it's clear to understand what I'm saying here, because some that are listening on radio, Paul Washer and all these other guys, they say stuff like this, and it distorts and ruins the grace of God who paid it all on the cross. So that it's not about struggling to be good, trying to pick up the cross. It means uh, make sure you're suffering for Christ. You're not, you're not commanded to suffer for Christ. You're commanded to follow Christ in the area of discipleship. But that's not the same thing as salvation. That's why it's crucial to understanding the separation of, of salvation and discipleship. Salvation, a one-time deal. Discipleship requires denying self, self-denial. So bottom of uh, this note here, denying self-denial means prioritizing Christ's will over personal desires. Implication, a voluntary act of submission in the life of a believer. I use the word voluntary because it's solely up to you. Some of you don't care about it. Some of you may not. When I say you, I, I have to consider that those listening online, because we have a lot of followers on our YouTube channel, and sometimes they leave me comments or shoot me an email and say, do you mean this? I'll say, yes. So people are listening. So when I say some will not self-denial, will not prioritize Christ, I'm not saying necessarily anybody here who's listening right now. I say you in general, kind of like um, if, if the Bible says um, he, it refers to he, she. And a bit, let me be careful. I'm not talking about pronouns. I'm saying he, she, meaning it represents all of humanity, man and woman. He, he loved him. You know, so it refers to man and woman. So when I say you, I'm not saying anyone behind the computer here that I'm looking at through my webcam. I'm saying you in general, that some will not deny self. Some will not exercise their volition to say, let it set aside their comforts to prioritize the will of God. Some will, some won't. But so long as you understand the truths that I'm covering tonight, then at least you can sleep well. And you can interact with people who follow those kind of faulty teaching. I wouldn't want you to listen to those guys, by the way. Paul Washer, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, who died several years ago. Still a, a very popular pastor in the Reformed the, uh, theolo theology. And the reason why is because it, they muddy up the grace of God. You have to remember, I don't want, I'm not too concerned about how... <clears throat> how strong their ministry is or how big of a ministry they have because God owns uh, a thousand cattle on all the hills, right? So you have to follow the Lord, not some particular ministry because your friends listen to them. You listen to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's your savior, not them, not the church, not any Bible study, not this group. It's not me. You listen to what I'm saying about the word of God. And if it's, if it's consistent with what we're seeing in the text of scripture, then now you're responsible to operate on these biblical truths. So self-denial means prioritizing Christ over your own personal desires. One comment before we go to the rest of the notes. I'm not suggesting that you have to um, lay aside your ambition. Some of you want to go to school. Some of you want to get... Uh, a certain pay, someone wants to uh, live comfortably and retire. Uh, some have, um, they want to maintain their certain level of um, 
comfort right now in life, that's perfectly fine. Uh, Ruben might want to keep his business thriving, and that's perfectly fine. It just I'm just saying that in the area of discipleship, when it talks about denying self, I'm painting to you, painting for you all what it means based on uh, my own personal study, based on research from the text of Scripture in Matthew 16, delving deeper into the text, using the Greek text, um, and looking at what it says in the Bible itself. So now you know denying self doesn't, because look at it like this. If I don't explain it like this, then the next time you listen to a Reformed theologian and he's pounding it behind the pulpit, guess what? You might be wondering like, oh, when was the last time I denied myself? When was the last time I picked up the cross? Oh my gosh, he might be right. Maybe I'm not really saved. So I, I just want us to all be on the same page that there's a distinction between those things that relate to salvation, those things that relate to discipleship. Sometimes they're blurred. People blur the two. And then when they preach it, and because they're um, many of them are eloquent in what they say, and they have booming voices, cranked up microphone. And so it startles people. I, I haven't denied myself. I, I'm not setting aside my personal ambitions. Does it mean setting aside your personal ambition? Yes. But in what context? In salvation? No. Discipleship. So that's a higher call. That's a higher level of commitment, a voluntary commitment that each of us have to make on their own time at their discretion, wherever they are in life. So I have decided to do my own of denying of self. I have certain comforts that I've shunned, certain things that I've shunned to prioritize him. And so I don't say that so that you all will do it. I'm just saying that's why I know what it means. I had to act upon this. Am I willing to set aside my personal interest? Yes. Why? Because he's worthy. Why? Because of what he's done for me. And because of what I know internally. Peace that surpasses all understanding. If a bullet hits me right between the head, I'll see you guys later. If I die, that's okay. I'm not afraid to die. And that's that kind of level of peace is beyond a million bucks for me. Today, people are stressed out. They don't know how to, where to walk anymore these days because they might get hurt. They might get jumped. Not me. I don't worry about that. Now, does that mean I'm sticking my head in the, in the sand? No. I'm just saying that the big picture is God's in control. I have enough of the word of God that has saturated my mind, my life, so that I know that should something happen to me, God knew this in eternity past. Here's my thinking. God knew it in eternity past. If he allowed it to happen, then it has passed through his permissive will. Does that mean he wanted that to happen? No. That just means that in the big scheme of things, he knew that this person was going to exercise their volition, pull the trigger. I would be in the way. I would unfortunately be there, and I'd get hit in the heart or in the eyes, in the brain, and I would die. Couldn't God have stopped that? Yes, he could have. What's the problem there? Well, if he stops it and intervenes, then he now overrides their volition to commit evil. And God never overrides your, your volition or anybody else's, lest he be accused of being fair, having favoritism. In, in other words, let's look at the, what do I mean by that? If he stops that guy from pulling the trigger to kill me, then he has to stop all evil, all potential evil and all actual evil. And God won't do that because if he, if he would have done that, the devil and everybody else could say, well, why didn't you do that when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit? We wouldn't have, have this mess. See, so we I factor all this in because of Bible doctrine, getting into the word of God so that when I go outside, I'm at complete peace because I know my Lord is watching out for me and he, whatever happens in my life, he allows because he's allowed, he's known this in eternity past. And as such, I have utmost peace wherever I go. If the rapture doesn't take place tomorrow, it doesn't matter to me because I'm still going to be in the center of his will, serving him, putting him first, denying self, getting the word out to other people that they need Christ. So self-denial is prioritizing Christ over personal desires. Will you do that? 
That's a call that you have to make in the privacy of your heart. I can't do it for you. Number four, how about taking up the cross? Well, notice how we're sliding contextually, breaking down his, what he said, Jesus said. In the first century context, the cross was a symbol of suffering, shame, and execution. People, Capital punishment, right? They died on that. Taking up your cross symbolizes a willingness to endure hardship and persecution for the sake of Christ. Are you willing to do that? If you are, then you understand what it means to take up the cross, because that's what it means. doesn't mean you have to die for Christ. That's, that's not part of the equation. That's not part of discipleship. That's not part of salvation. Though Reformed theologians, who are very predominant today, will teach that. You know why Reformed theologians are? You know why I'm very adamant about you staying away from Reformed theologians? Because not only do they mishandle the Word of God, they stomp on the grace of God, which is beyond... I think almost blasphemous, but you won't have peace and you're going to walk around thinking like, I got to, uh, I got to pick up the cross lest I'm not saved. That's not what it's talking about. It symbolizes a willingness to endure hardship and persecution for the sake of Christ. And guess what? That's not proving you're saved. That's proving on the other hand, whether or not you are willing to be a hardcore disciple of Christ. Notice my words there. Are you willing to pick up your cross and follow Christ? Are you willing to deny yourself? That guy's hardcore. He's running hard for Jesus. Winston is hard, running hard for Jesus. So now when he takes up the cross, Winston knows that it's a symbol of suffering. He's, is he willing to suffer? Family is bashing him because he's a believer in Christ. He's going to remain steadfast, say, look, I, I'm not here to argue, but I still believe that Jesus is worthy of my utmost attention, my commitment to him. So Winston keeps hammering and hammering and planting seeds. And over, do, over, over the course of time, they may come to faith. You might have people that may not believe in what you believe in. They may not believe in Jesus. But you have to remember that seeds planted will take root. And if you don't plant the seeds, then they're going to wind up in hell or the lake of fire, lest they acquiesce to Jesus, not by picking up the cross, not by denying their personal interests, not by um, denying themselves, and picking up the cross, but by believing in Jesus. See the difference? Believing in Jesus is so much easier, isn't it? You've already crossed that path. But to be a disciple of Christ requires a massive shift of commitment, a voluntary commitment. Remember my words, voluntary and commitment. It's a voluntary commitment on your part, on my part, towards God. And if you want to see it in action, faith without works is dead, if you want to see it in action, then you need to deny yourself, set aside yourself, your ambitions, your personal desires, your goals, your whatever it is that your is important to you. If you're willing to deny that or yourself and follow Christ and pick up your cross and be willing to be uh, to suffer for his namesake, now you're showing me you're a disciple. I can't see your salvation. You can't see my salvation. You might be able to see my commitment to Christ. He might be able to say, oh, Freddie's really committed. He's really serving God. He really puts everything on hold and puts God first in his life. He just keeps going, going, going. Now you're seeing my discipleship in action, not my salvation. You can't see what tra transpired on the inside. You can't see the new man in me. I, neither can I see you. I can't see the new you. I can see whether or not you're prioritizing Christ, I can see whether or not you're living as a voluntary disciple of Christ because it's voluntary because it's, he says, deny self, follow me. He doesn't command you, but if you want to be a follower of Christ, then you can do those things. And that's why we're picking this apart, taking up the cross. First century, it meant symbol of suffering, shame, execution, taking up your cross, symbolizes a willingness to endure hardship and persecution for the sake of Christ. Historical context, understanding the weight of the cross in Jesus' time. So modern application, what's this mean? Enduring hardship and trials for the sake of Christ. So now let, let me just take us down to the closing point, the thing here. While discipleship involves commitment and self-sacrifice, it is still grounded in grace. 
The ability to not to deny oneself, take up the cross and follow Christ comes from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, not human effort alone. So once you are following Christ and you experience the horsepower that comes from God, the Holy Spirit, it's almost addictive because you you just have this surge of power that almost keeps you going like you're on caffeine or something. And you don't have to stop. You keep going and going, going, because it's, like I said, it's almost addicting because you sense a real peace that surpasses all understanding. You're almost impervious to anything that's trying to distract you. And that's part of the reason why I think I do what I do, because the Holy Spirit is basically almost carrying me to the next step. Because as, as, I, um, as I exercise my will towards his ways, then the Holy Spirit empowers me. That's the only way to describe it. So let me see if there's anything else. Okay. Uh, let me just give you the summary points because we're already out of time. We're way overboard. I'll just hit these uh, closing points. Number one, salvation versus discipleship. Remember the differences between the two. Distinguish between salvation as a gift and discipleship as a voluntary commitment. Very, very important because someone's going to say, you know what, Arnie, um, Sarah, if you're not committed to Jesus Christ, you're not even saved, man. Well, no, salvation is prioritizing, uh, believing in Christ. Discipleship is something that requires a commitment, a voluntary commitment, depending on my love for God, depending on my willingness to commit to God. Now, if I don't, I'm still saved. It's just my discipleship is not where your discipleship level is. So make the distinction between the two. Context of Matthew, remember what that's all about. The audience as believers and the purpose is a call to deeper commitment. I pointed out the context of Matthew 16. Why is that important? Because his disciples were already believers. If Jesus is saying, I want you believers to be believers, well, then you have to pick up the cross, deny yourself, follow me. Now we have a case, but he's not going to say, follow me if you want to be my believers, because they're now following him. He says, if you want to be disciples of mine, pick up your cross, deny yourself, come follow me. So we, that's why context, context, context is very, very important. Denying self. We saw that prioritize Christ will over personal de desires in the life of a believer. A couple more here. Three more. Taking up your cross. Understand the historical context of the cross, apply it to modern day hardships for Christ. Number five, following Christ, actively pursue a life that reflects Jesus's teachings and character. Role of grace in discipleship. Acknowledge that discipleship is empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, and fueled by grace that comes from sound doctrine. So I apologize that we went... 25 minutes overboard, but I was on a roll and I sensed that I, I have, I captured your attention here. And so I didn't want to stop in the middle of my uh, presentation because again, this is extremely important. And this is something that we all need to be clear on lest we fall prey to reform teaching. And then we get confused. And then if you're trying to get someone in the church who is reformed and they just became a believer, they're going to say, well, Suzanne, I don't want to be a believer now. I, I don't want to pick up my cross and follow Jesus. I mean, I'm still in school. I don't want to follow Jesus. I, I just wanted to be a Christian. Now you're telling me I have to deny self, pick up the cross. You didn't tell me that in the beginning. And so now that you know the importance of why you must separate discipleship and salvation, it will be easier to share the gospel with others. Once this is clear in your mind, you won't blur, follow Jesus, pick up your cross and follow me. Faith without works is dead. Make sure you're doing things because if you don't have faith with works, you're proving you're not saved. And guess what? We saw that that's not true. That doesn't, that's not what James 2 is talking about. Anyways, if you're interested in these notes, let me know. Um, Message me on Messenger or email me or text me, and I can send this to you because I know we barreled through it, but there's a lot of good content here that it would be worthwhile to either listen to this on our YouTube channel or let me know. And I'll, I, I send some of you the rec audio recording of this, so let me know, and I could either post it on 
messenger or just send you a link or something because there's a lot of good things here. Several people were not able to join tonight, but uh, I got to get them the information on this as well because there's a lot of good things here, I believe. If you don't believe so, well, maybe you know it already, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here that is worthwhile. These are graduate level information that you would learn in a typical seminary class. And I'm not saying that just so you'll say, oh, I went to seminary. No, this is what we do. This is what we do on Tuesday nights. So be proud, be thankful to God that we can do this together. We're learning together. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it opens your eyes so that you can say, I know something new about the Bible because this is what helps me grow. Because when you learn something new, you're growing. If you're not learning anything new, you're not growing. And so that affects me and that impacts me as a teacher. That means I'm not doing my job and I'm not doing a good job of teaching. So I, I want you guys to, to grow, to bring him honor and glory. But having said that, let's close in a word of prayer. And thank you for being so patient and allowing me to finish. I know you, nobody threw tomatoes, so I'm grateful. Hi, Connie. I see you there. So anyways, um, I can give you. I just, uh, oh, yeah. just thank God for you. Uh, what you have taught us, uh -huh. the Word of God, and I praise Lord God about about you. Thank Me. God for giving us you. Oh well, I'm thankful for you all because I just want to tell people more about His grace, so that once you get grounded in His grace, you can tell others about His grace. You can point people to Christ, and they can have life everlasting. So I do this, and like I've said from day one. Whoever stays with this and learns and more and more and more, you're going to be more comfortable over time. And you'll, you'll see a gradual up, uh, upward um, spike in your spiritual walk with God, not because I'm special, but because the word of God is special. And if the word of God is going to be taught, it's going to bring people closer to him. The Bible says, don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if I'm showing you the word of God consistently, then you're going to be transformed. So, Amen. So thank you. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Rudy. Wasn't expecting that, but thank you. No, it, it's very true. Uh, thank you. It's very true. All I right. learn a lot. I uh, learn a lot. Well, thank you. Well, I try. So uh, let us, oh, Theta is there. Tess is there. Gladys, Ninita, Rod. Oh, nice. Susanna, Ruben. Okay, very good. Uh, I think that's Jasmine. I think that's Jasmine or Jenny. Um, I think, uh, let me see. All right, let's close in a word of prayer and thank you again, as always. Father, thank you for Father. Oh, what, what's that, Sarah? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was praying aloud. aloud. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity for us to be together on a regular basis so that we can bring you honor and glory because you alone deserve it. We thank you, Father, that we can learn from your truth and realize, Father, how gracious you truly are. You love us in spite of whether or not we commit to you. You've committed yourself to us. And so, Father, I hope that as we continue to mature and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we in turn would be able to reciprocate and point people to Jesus Christ. So we love you and we thank you for all of these things. And we ask all of this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank everybody. You, Pastor. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.